My name is Mark DePue. I'm the Director of Oral History at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Today is October 22, 2008, and it's my pleasure today to have an opportunity to interview Matt Hughes. Uh, you used Matt versus Matthew? Oh, yes. Okay, excellent. Matt, uh, when and where were you born? I was born uh, near Litchfield, Illinois, on a small farm I grew up on, kind of halfway between Litchfield and Gillespie, and um, born on July 19th, 1965. Okay, and tell us a little bit about your parents. Uh, my parents um, are Dale and Rosemary. Um, my father uh, was worked at the post office most of his life and farmed on the side, kind of a hobby farmer, but um, we, as I grew up, we kind of expanded the operation a little bit uh, until I left for college. Uh, my wife was a school teacher before they got married, and, and um, after she had me, she kind of came back home to raise me, and then uh, after she raised the kids, we, I had two sisters, and, and got us all off into college. She went back and taught for a few more years. So. What kind of farming was your dad doing? We had a, uh, a cash grain and uh, beef operation, and then I added some feeder pigs to it uh, as I got in high school, but um, mainly like corn, soybeans, and wheat, and some hay and then black Angus cattle and a little bit of everything. Right? Yeah, it was a pretty diverse <clears throat> operation. My grandfather on my mother's, my mother's father um, had, was a butcher and he raised a lot of livestock for the, that and that kind of spilled over in our, our operation and he had a lot of chickens and, and cattle and pigs as well and then and eventually we kind of adopted that too. Did your parents own that land? Yes, um, we owned everything we farmed back then we uh, and like I said it was pretty diverse and dad had an off-farm job and it, it wasn't our main source of income but it was definitely important and supplemented uh, what we needed to live on. If you were to ask him what your profession is what would he have told you? Well I, like I said his main income was from the post office and he was a letter carrier for um, over 30 years 35 years and and that that was I think that's what he would say his main profession is. If you ask him today, now he's a retired farmer. So <laughs> so he identifies himself today as a farmer. Oh, I think, oh, definitely. I think he always identified himself as a farmer, but um, I mean, primarily, mm -hmm. if you had, would have asked him, he would have said you know, he was getting most of his income from the post office. How many acres did he have? Oh, uh, we had about 200 acres for, for crops and such, and then, um, then we had about 30 beef cows, and then we raised most of the calves and all the way through finish. I'll put you on the spot here. How far back could he have traced that land in terms of ownership in the family? Well, I went back to my grandfather. My grandfather um, had, well, probably, my lineage probably goes back to my great-grandfather, if I remember correctly, and they came over here and settled in around the Irving area, and, and, um, and my grandfather kind of moved away from the farm and came over and, and found this land where we live, where my father lives now, and he started farming that and was a fairly good sized farmer for his day back then and then and then when my father got married he bought the farm from grandma and grandpa and, and he moved out there and, and uh, we've had it ever since. So. When would uh, the initial purchase of land, would that have been an early 19th or early 20th century? Oh well my grandfather would have been back to yeah early early 20th century yeah about um, probably in like the 1930s 40s yeah, I, and I don't know the exact history on that, but that's my understanding of basically what happened. Okay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what uh, you did on the farm in terms of chores growing up. Oh yeah, uh, you know it was it was really a, a, a life building experience. It was it was the old traditional you know g something to do in the morning and night you know go out and take care of livestock before you go to school and and then when we got home at night do all the chores again feed them and and bed them, bed the cattle with straw and, and feed them corn and hay, whatever we needed to do. And, um, you know, that was typical year round. And then, of course, we had the seasonal things where, um, you know, if we were planting season, I'd get out and you know, we'd have to work ground and plant it. And, and um, hard, you know, sometimes we had a, back in those days, you know, we still walked beans and, and did a lot of hand labor to, to take care of some of the weeds after we did some mechanical work. And then, of course, got in harvest and that was always the funnest time for me. Well, later on we're going to actually see you harvest a bean field or two, uh, but what exactly does walking beans mean? Oh, yeah. I think I know, but yeah. in case for some people who don't. Well, you know, <clears throat> walking beans is literally, uh, you, we, we had 
probably take every measure up till then with mechanical beans. We would, after the crop was planted and started to come up, you'd run a, a rotary hole through it to try to get some, rid of some of the smaller weeds, and then the crop would get a little bit bigger, and you'd take a, field, a cultivator through the middle of the rows and get out some of the bigger weeds, and eventually the crop would just get too big to run equipment through it anymore. And of course, back then we didn't have the chemicals we have today, so the weeds would still keep on coming, and, and so then it was time to resort to your, your feet, and you'd start walking up and down the rows, and you'd, um, Typically in a soybean field, it didn't happen too much in corn because the corn would get ahead of the weeds and shade them out. But the bean field, you'd typically take a couple of rows and just start walking up and down and, and, and take a weed hook, which was a sharp instrument to cut the weeds off. And you cut them off and then just just keep walking back and forth. And all over the course of a day, you cover maybe 20 acres and then go back and do that the next day. And you know, over the course of a week, you might get across all the soybeans you had. So. Well, how many miles a day would you be walking? Then? Oh, boy, you know, you're talking about a half mile field that's, uh, oh, you're going to walk, heck, I probably walk 20 miles a day easy. You know, I mean, you don't do this all day long, you're going to get tired and you'll quit. <laughs> yeah, and that's obviously going on in the summertime when you don't have school. What right. time would you wake up in the morning uh, to do chores be while, while you were in school? Oh, when I was in school, you know, typically I'd be getting up. Uh, the bus would come about, boy, when, when did the bus come? I think it was about 7.30, I'd get on the bus in the morning. So that meant I had to get out. We kept the chore schedule kind of light in the mornings, but um, usually I'd get up about 6 o'clock and go out and do about a half hour's worth, worth of work and then um, come in, get cleaned up, and, and uh, get ready for school and get everything packed up and have breakfast and, and then be ready to get on that bus at 7.30. Were you going to a school? that uh, there was a lot of farm kids? Yeah, actually the area I grew up in was a big coal mining country and I'd say the predominance of those people were, were uh, kids of fathers who were working in the coal mines. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, um, the second biggest occupation then would have been, been farmers and, and real kids like that. But, uh, were you involved in 4-H or FFA when you were in high school? Uh, I was very active in FFA. Um, we were, again, it was kind of a sparsely populated area and for rural kids at the time, and um, our 4-H club at the moment was kind of on the outs. My father was very active in 4-H, but uh, we didn't really have an active 4-H club in my area, and I think since now it's kind of come back. But I was very active in FFA when I got in high school and, and uh, participated in a lot of events there and, and kind of ended up as president and even vice pre president of the section and kind of uh, made all my degrees there. So. Tell me a little bit about, more about uh, being an FFA. Did you have a chance to uh, exhibit or, or take some of the things to go to the state fair, things like that? Well, yeah, FFA, we didn't really focus too much on the state fair, per se. We had our own um, FFA fairs that I got to take some things to and, and exhibit. We'd take, uh, take samples of my product, you know, projects. Yeah, basically, I took, took all the projects we grew on the farm. I had corn, soybeans, and wheat, and, and beef cattle. It was my and, and feeder pigs. And those are my five major products projects. And so for them, from the corn, we'd take a sample. Of the grain we'd grow to all the. You know, you'd have to sort through all the grain, clean it up, make it look really nice, and show how good a quality you produce there. Um, occasionally, on the uh, for the beef cattle, I had a heifer I did show once, but um, didn't really get into that. The livestock showing too much. But, uh, but that sounds like a great education in terms of what the new innovative trends are in agriculture for a young kid. Oh yeah, uh, you know back then that was FFA was all about agriculture and, and future farmers of America, and it's a, still a great organization. But even that organization has changed tremendously. I mean, you know today it's known as FFA. They don't even refer to it as future farmers anymore because it's kind of transitioned. My chapter back then we were a high school. Gillespie was a high school of about 400 total kids. It was a consolidated district, so it's fairly large. But it's still not by any city standards, but it was fairly large for what it was. And our ag class was 20 to 30 kids, which pretty good sized class. Um, today, and most of those were farmers. Today, <clears throat> you get the same kind of class size, but um, I'd say you know, only two or three of those are going to be farmers today. And most of them are city kids interested in horticulture or other non-traditional ag occupations. And, 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 and in no way I'm, I'm no way belittling. I'm just trying to say, you know, that's kind of what's happened. The, 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 the rural population has really dwindled as far as the number of kids that are really 
and and the number of farmers has has declined, and that's you see that reflected today. So it's it was a much different world when I was going to school than it is today. And we're talking about the '70s, even. Yeah, that was. Um, when did that, you graduate? I graduated in 1983 from high school. So this was 1979 through 1983. I was in high school, and and um, yes, that was that was the time period. It was yeah, right after the big green rev grain revolution we had of, of the '70s, and right before the big downturn of the 80s. <laughs> when you say grain revolution, what do you mean? Uh, the, uh, with all the, the Russian <clears throat> buildup with buying, they, you know, they started buying all our grain in the 70s and we had the big land price increases and the grain prices, you know, the soybeans went up into the teens and we just saw, you know, that was when Errol Butts came out and said plant fence row to fence row and then of course then, the, then it all came to a crashing halt when Jimmy Carter put the grain embargo on and and then we led into the 80s, but uh, but this is the same time frame, you know, when the when the market kind of takes a dive, that you're making decisions about what you want to do for the rest of your life. So in high school, what did you want to do with your life? Well, you know, I'd grown up on this farm. Um, both my grandparents had been farmers, and much of my family was farmers. My dad had an off-farm job, but he still was interested in the farm. And I had every intention to come back and expand the operation and. And really, most of my courses were focused on that, and uh, in high school, in high school even, and um, took a lot of you know auto mechanic classes, and and we had uh, our agriculture classes offered a lot of vocational skills like welding and such. But I, I was always getting all the math and science that I could fit on top of that. But uh, always put a little more priority on the vocational skills, and and uh, of course I was a pretty good student. I I was valedictorian in my class, and. People kind of recognized that pretty quick and started trying to <laughs> trying to steer me down a different path. <laughs> well, what path were they trying to kind of suggest you should take with your yeah, life? Yeah, but uh, well, you know, they they recognized things in me I hadn't seen yet. But uh, um, so you know, I by the time I got later in my high school career, I started putting more focus on the academics and. I kind of decided I'd really need to pursue this academic thing a little bit more before I came back to farming, but still had in the back of my mind that's where I was going to ultimately end up, and I think I kind of made that happen. But um, yeah, I had every intention in high school though. I was I really wanted to farm, and that's that's really all I ever knew growing up. What you just said it sounds like some people were almost discouraging you from going through that path, or were they? Was it more just encouraging you to go to college? Well. You know, it's the same mentality today. Um, I don't know that you'd call it discouragement as much as, as as encouraging to make sure you keep your options open. And you know, we do that with our children today too. You know, uh, there's I'm not going to dictate what they want to do, and I, and I'm glad nobody dictated what I should be doing. I had my ideas, and they were just trying to say keep your options open. And, and they started seeing talents and skills in me that I could go a lot of other places and just back to the farm at that time. Well, <laughs> You strike me as a pretty modest guy, but I'm going to put you on the spot. What things were they seeing in you that they were wanting to have the opportunity to develop more fully, and who are the people we're talking about? Well, um, you know, my parents were always very supportive and let me take whatever path I wanted, and they were always there for me, and they sacrificed a lot so we could do whatever we needed to do. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I had a few teachers in high school that kind of ultimately grabbed me and and um, and said, you know, you need to. You're you're a good academic student, and got a lot of. And I I, I already had been exhibiting a lot of good leadership skills, and there's just a lot of things. There's a lot of reasons I need to continue my math and science, and 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 economic focus is where I ultimately ended up, and 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 ultimately uh, the leadership skills and things that I've done. even. If I would have went straight back to the farm, I probably would have missed out a lot of opportunities by. Going out and exploring these other avenues, I was able to learn so much more about the world, so much more about the rest of how the industry works and how it all comes together. And, and today I'm um, much more suited to, to take on the challenges I see coming here. Where did you go to college? Uh, University of Illinois, Champaign, Urbana. Why there? <laughs> well, what was your major? Right, um, I started off in agriculture, the College of Agriculture. My, my major was animal science uh, for my bachelor's degree. And I really started off in there again because of my um, my love for the beef cattle and, and uh, that occupation there, and um, and ultimately I got a scholarship 
that was good at the University of Illinois, so I kind of took advantage of that, and that led me into the animal science arena there as well. Um, as I got into that program, um, quickly found that most, most of the people in that program were pretty much focused on veterinary medicine. And I was, again, <laughs> pretty, pretty unique in that I was really more focused on production. I really still had the intention at that time I was going to learn all I could at college and take it back and apply it on the farm. And um, that's really what my focus was, was about real life production agriculture and economics and things like that. I was, and I wanted to know all I could, could about feeding cattle and, and things like that, but I wasn't so much interested in the medicine part of it that, that you get into. Well, I, I didn't hear you say much about the grain side of the business either. Were you less interested in that? Well, no, I was very interested in that as well, but I, the grain side was a little less complex to me. It was, at the time, I, it was more simplistic. And, you know, for, as a farmer, I just thought, go out, you plant it, you have agronomists that kind of help you through it, but you, know, you plant the crops and they kind of take care of themselves and then you harvest it. The cattle was always a challenge growing up to me because they were, you know, you could feed them different, you could do different things, treat them, you know, what, why, I could see things I did to them that had made a real effect and I didn't understand it. I didn't quite see that on the crop side at that time. And again, I was, you know, I was more focused growing up on the cattle, I guess. But, um, so I was more interested in learning how, how I could do a better job raising cattle and livestock. Let's get you up to your junior and senior yeah. year in college. And I wanted I want to know what your thoughts at that time are, what you're going to do with your life. Well, there again, you know, I pretty much figured out by that time I'd transitioned most of my classes to the Ag Economics Department. I was taking a lot of finance and, and economics and marketing, um, and I was taking a lot of the nutritional classes I needed, I thought I was going to need for breeding and such. And I kind of identified an opportunity maybe to, to go out west and work on a cattle operation for a while, and I thought, you know, the feedlots out there looked kind of appealing. So I started exploring that, and um, so that at one point became a goal. And there again, I started excelling, and, and again, I, I was graduated, pretty much taught my class <laughs> over there. And, um, so you had, had professors <laughs> who were taking you under their wing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of hard for me to talk about some of these things because I don't usually brag like this, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay. <laughs> We need to understand right. how somebody like yourself, who obviously has a lot of yeah. talent, ends up doing what you're doing right. today and what it takes to be successful doing yeah. that. So this is important. Yeah. So, so again, I had, I had some professor, professors intervene and realized how much talent I had. And, and I ultimately had a professor in, in the marketing department that, that, that identified me and started, take, took me under his wing, and, and uh, we did an undergraduate research project. And he really started steering me toward graduate college. And, uh, and that's where I ended up then. I ended up staying on for another two years and getting a master's in ag economics working for this professor and, and uh, kind of focused on the livestock marketing aspect of it. And again, more, and even expanding more into like decision-making theories and, and trying to use more technology in that, that arena. But, um, so ultimately, I guess that's where I ended up. After I left the university, that's what I kind of had was a, a real strong animal science production, economics background, and then really specializing more in, in the marketing and technology arena to kind of expand there. When did you graduate from college? Well, I got my BS in, in 1987, and then um, I got a master's in 1989. What was the uh, project that you worked on for your master's thesis? My master's thesis, um, I actually com could have completed my master's a lot quicker, but I ended up getting a, taking a job. It's kind of an ongoing internship while I was doing it, so it kind of extended things. That was also very valuable work for a local research, cons or, excuse me, a local consulting firm. But they were doing a lot of consulting work on like models that help, for example, one of the big clients was the farm credit service, and they would go and train their, their um, loan officers how to evaluate financial, um, excuse me, evaluate financial statements, and they would create computer models to help them do that. And that kind of intrigued me, but that's what my thesis ultimately ended up being was decision support systems. And I really focused on how to use, at that time it was really basic stuff, Lotus 1, 2, 3, how to program Lotus spreadsheets. And, and, and at that time that's a very powerful instrument, you know, and, and, and you can see where we've come from there. But I was kind of focused on how you could use those kind of tools to, to make, to build what-if scenarios, to build, uh, to, to spread some of the basic handwritten things we had done that time and, and explored some of the theories that go into that and how you, you can, better use those in, in decision making and, and uh, so that that's that's what my thesis became was decision support systems 
And um, then I was able to use that to help, to, you know, to, to work and to expand that in the area of the, the research that I eventually got into. Your career goals, by the time you're finishing up your, uh, your master's thesis, so have they evolved away from going back to farming towards something else? Well, by the time I got into graduate school, then, you know, the farming kept getting a little bit put further back and further back, and I still had the desire ultimately to get back. At that time, though, I think I kind of reserved reserved that I was going to probably end up working for a few years in the industry and then um, seeing where it led to. But um, ultimately, I was still hoping to get back to the farm at some point. Okay. Just didn't know what capacity it would be at that. So what was the job coming out of graduate school? Well, my first job out of graduate school then was I moved to St. Louis and worked for Doan Marketing Research. And they're a firm that specializes in agricultural research. It's, they're the people that that a lot of farmers are going to, or even people, you know, city people will uh, appreciate this. You know, you get these telemarketers calling up asking you survey questions, but you know, they focus on the agriculture. They focus on calling farmers or, and sending out surveys and asking them, you know, what brands of corn they plant and how much, what kind of feed they use for their livestock and things like that. So, but uh, that was my first job as a project director for for Doe Market Research, which means I over, I work with clients to help develop. Um, a study that would address a specific question they had, like you know. Um, ultimately, I ended up taking charge of one of the bigger projects, was which was called their seed study, which answered the question of how what brands do farmers use and what's the market share of all the brands, and then that was a study we would sell to most of the major seed companies. And um, my job was basically to to develop the questionnaire and design it so that farmers would understand it. And to, to explain how the inter to teach the interviewers how to ask the questions properly, and then to collect the data, and then to take. And then my next job was to take that data and make sure it was valid, and uh, turn it into results that that my client could use, and then then to present those results to my client and let him help him use it. Did but, you uh, find that to be an interesting and challenging job? Yeah, it was very interesting because I got to um, really relate to a lot of farmers and use. It was a it was a unique pos uh, position I was in because I, I was a unique, a unique individual at that time because I was working in a corporate environment with coming straight from the farm with a, you know, I was almost a farmer working in a corporate environment and I could really relate to what they needed. And I was working alongside of people that were, you know, I was working alongside computer programmers that had no concept of what agriculture was. Working alongside, you know, university professors that really never even grown up on a farm. <laughs> You know, so I, they were always leaning on me to get the production practical aspect of it. But at the same token, I was a classically trained economist, economist at this point. I, I understood statistics and how to program statistics and do all that. So I, I was a really an integral um, go-between between everything could, to, to really could explain things from a farmer level, but also could understand it from the, the academic standpoint at this point. So uh, I became a pretty unique commodity and. and and it was, and I got, I'm the kind of individual, as long as, long as I can see, I'm in a unique position. I'm providing some value that nobody else can, and you know, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> well, this is also an important part of your life because I think you met your wife about this time, or at least you got married during this yeah. time, right? Yeah, actually, we met in college. Um, and she, I met, we, we were both in college at the same time and um, uh, met her as a freshman. And, and, this, and we, let's get the name out there so we know what oh. we're talking about. Yeah, my, my wife Connie and Connie Schneider and we met um, met really about the first uh, first day I got to college really and and uh, didn't date right away but later on in the semester we started dating and um, really dated throughout college and then uh, and then kind of marriage was kind of inevitable at some point but we got kept getting pushed off for uh, my academic pursuits at that time and then once I finally got to St. Louis we decided that time was right. And, she had uh, graduated and went on to a, a job as commodity analyst, working for a commodity analyst in, over in Morton. And uh, so she was been working there for about a year, about the time I moved to St. Louis. And then we decided we we're going to get married. And so then we all, I moved her down to St. Louis. And, and uh, ultimately, I guess that's the reason we ended up back here is because when I drug away from her job in Morton, the St. Louis economy at that time was a little more depressed and, and jobs were a little more scarce. And, uh, she ultimately found a job, but not the one she really wanted. Uh, at the same time, her father was expanding this operation and had need for somebody to come back. And so 
she was actually the one that drugged me back here and started farming with her father. And I was able to get a job for Growmark, which is positioned right in Bloomington. We're, we're just 15 miles south of Bloomington here, so it was an ideal position. Um, I could work at Growmark in the same capacity I was doing for Dome. Okay. Um, we should identify where here is. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. What, right now, this farm is located near Shirley, Illinois. And again, I said that's about 15 miles south of uh, Bloomington, right off of I-55. And um, we're in Funks Grove Township is where the bulk of the operation is located. And, has a lot of history there that we could talk about forever, but but that's been unique. One of my favorite yeah. <laughs> yes, um, but you know they, they're an important figure for Illinois history, and a lot of people will recognize that. But um, and what's your what's Connie's connection with this land? <clears throat> well, this particular land was um, her father had started the, the operation and moved from actually he grew up and has a, a long history himself on that side uh, in the Menunk area, which is up north of Bloomington, but um, when he asked, after he got old enough and decided he was going to go off and farm on his own, he came down here and started this operation, and um, they moved and he moved his family down here in 1972, and Connie was in second grade about that time, and and uh, so she grew up right here. Uh, came, she went grew to up in the farmhouse right next to us. Right, yeah, right here where we're living today. Her did her father own this land? No, no, her father never owned anything. Um, I think he owned 40 acres at one time, and then he sold that. But um, he, he basically started and, and was just a um, tenant farmer or crop share farmer, however you want to put it. And um, his, um, his focus and, and our philosophy still is, you know, he, he took the focus. He was going to put his time and resources and equipment and then let somebody else take care of the ownership of the land and, and really specialize in what he could do. But it strikes me, though, that there was a strong connection to the land or else Connie wouldn't have come back here and you wouldn't have followed her here. Well, he was able to start this operation and, and it, you know, tenant farming is its own unique thing. I mean, you don't just go out and, uh, you don't just go out and find a piece of land and buy it. You know, it's pretty easy, not easy, but it's relatively easy to go out and somebody puts a piece of land up for sale and you go buy it and you start farming it and you own it and you make all the decisions. As a tenant farmer, you know, you've got to go out and solicit a landowner to let you farm for him, essentially. You're, it's like a job interview, I guess, in a lot of ways. So, and, and you have to do that. And then we have, we have six landlords. <clears throat> so you, you, know, you don't just do it one time. You have to get enough, a big enough pool in the same area. Well, at that time, we were focused on the same area. Now we're getting more spread out. But you're trying to get a big enough pool of land in the same area to get enough landowners to let you do that. And, uh, so it's much more challenging to, to put that operation together. And then holding that together is even more challenging. But he was able to put together, uh, you know, a pretty good base. And he built that to the size where he was needing a little help and he was getting ready to retire and transition out as well. Um, so it was a good opportunity for her to come back and an opportunity for us to move into an, an existing operation and, and transition into it. How many acres did he have at that time? At that time, he was, um, when he started here, he, he started with 1,200 acres and he grew that to about, it grew that to about 2,000, and then, um, um, and then when we came back, we got that up to uh, about 2,500 at one point, and then over the course of years, we've we've lost a little land to the Bloomington development. <laughs> Built, they planted houses instead of corn, but uh, but uh, so we lost a farm there, and then you, you you always lose a take and give and take a little bit here and there, and then then ultimately he decides who wanted to retire. So then that was a, another. You know, we lose that labor, so we we just holding on what we had and building back up to maintain what we had took some time, and now we're starting to grow again. So, and your what's the size of the operation today? Uh, today we're we're up to about uh, today we build it back up to about 2,200 acres, and probably by next year we're going to be about around 2,500 acres. So. Okay. We kind of skipped over one part of this. You were at Dome Market yeah. in St. Louis, and then you came up to Bloomington. Yeah. So we we had an opportunity. Um, I was working for Doan Marketing Research down in St. Louis. I took my wife down there, and, and she had an opportunity to come back here and work for her father. And then I found the job at Growmark doing essentially the same thing I was doing for Doan. Um, but again, now working for a, a traditional agricultural uh, distributor. And of course, Growmark's the, the distributor for FS. But I uh, was able to work in their marketing research department. And actually, that was even another additional challenge because now I was actually working for one of my clients 
and taking the research, doing some primary research that they needed done, but also taking other research and, and helping make decisions that would be ultimately implemented in the company and, and working with other people there as well. So I had an opportunity to start working for them and it was an ideal place to be because I could, could work my, uh, what were they working then, eight to, eight to four a day, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. You know, I'd go in five days a week at Growmark and then I, every night I'd come home and help out whatever was needed done here on the farm and have my weekends to work here. And, and of course, Connie was here full time. And then ultimately, uh, by 1997, um, uh, I'd become more and more involved, and, uh, was, and Terry was wanting to transition out, and I was, it was just becoming, the demands were too great, and we finally made a decision, it was a good time, and we just came back, and I, I've been farming here full-time ever since. Terry is Connie's father? Now. Right, right. And, uh, but tell me a little bit about the nature of the partnership that you and Connie have in managing this land. Oh. <laughs> Uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, she's my wife, and, and I do what she tells me to do. <laughs> uh, oh, you know, that's a unique challenge. That, that really is. Um, boy, um, we, we have a pretty good, I think it's a really strong relationship, but, but at the same token, it, it, we put our, it's a burden at times. It, it really taxes you to try to work with each other on a day-in, day-out basis, making financial decisions, and and the risks and things that go with farming, and you're both in the same boat, and you're both, you know, we don't have the off-farm income or the benefits that a lot of couples around here have, and, you know, we put all our eggs in one basket in some respects, and so that, that makes a challenge, but, uh, but at the same token, there's, there's, I don't know, I wouldn't give it up for anything. It's, you know, to be able to work with my wife and be with her uh, all the time, and all the time we get to spend with my kids, we're both together, and we have a lot of flexibility to raise our kids the way we want to be raised, and we don't have to let other people raise them for us. And How many children do you have? I have two children. I have a, a boy, Thaddeus, that's 11, and a, a girl, Marissa, that's 6. And, and Thaddeus is in 6th grade, and Marissa started kindergarten this year. So, What do you see as the future for that? Uh, well, I think... Uh, Thaddeus is taken after the, both of his parents. It's pretty obvious. He's he's going to be smart, and he's um, he excels in math and science, and he's constantly building things. But um, I think he's going to probably be an engineer. <laughs> um, you think there's a, a interest or a love for farming that that he would have? Yeah, you know, I actually see that more in my daughter. Um, I think she's going to be the the little farmer, but. <laughs> But that's yet to be seen. Uh, well, how old will Thaddeus be when he starts driving some uh, farm machines for you? <laughs> well, <clears throat> don't you don't usually get to talk a lot about my family for some reason. <laughs> but um, always talk about them with my friends and such, but never on camera. But um, you know, that's that's been a real challenge. You know, when I was a kid, I was driving a tractor when I was five years old, and I was probably operating a combine when I was 11 and um, I was I was doing a lot of things that probably people would have uh, this today would have came in and probably took them took me away from my parents <laughs> <laughs> but that's but I wasn't I wasn't at all out of the ordinary and that, that's kind of the way farm life was today um, I've been struggling on figuring out how to we finally got Thaddeus starting mowing grass and I think still today I pr probably could get in trouble for that. If I hired a kid to do that, I can't do that. I mean, you know, there's, but, um, but we, we watch him and, you know, we supervise a lot of things. There's just a lot of things he can't do uh, with the equipment the way it is, and I wouldn't let him do it the way the equipment I have today is nothing like I grew up with. Mm -hmm. It's bigger, it's more sophisticated, um, and there's, and he's just, I wouldn't be suited to, to operate at his age, but, um, so things are a lot different. It's been a lot more challenging to expose him to the agriculture I grew up with, and, even trying to get them to do the chores, you know, we don't. We've become more specialized in grain production. I don't have that livestock around to to, to make him have that work ethic. But we we look for the opportunities to have pets, and Connie still has horses, so there's some responsibility for him. But that's been a struggle. That's. I did want to ask about the decision to get away from the livestock side of the business and concentrate on the grain. Yes. What was involved with that pro that decision process? Well, you know, actually, by moving back here, the livestock really left McLean County in the, probably in the 70s, it, maybe even back to the 60s, it started leaving, but 
it really came with the, we talked earlier about the revolution we had in the 70s and when grain prices shot up the way they did you know McLean County has always been viewed as some of the best soil and climate in the world and the land was just so valuable they couldn't afford to, to they, at that time they didn't think they could afford to have livestock in anymore and they they turned all the feedlots back and all the pasture into cropland and and uh, the livestock kind of really exited the county and really have never come back to the extent they have existed before. They're coming back in a different form, but basically what happened is, you know, th this area was one of the first to really start specializing, and that's what happened. We specialized in corn and soy production in this county, and even today, most of the operations have moved in that direction. When If you're in livestock, you're specializing in livestock. That's your primary focus. If you're, in, if you're not in livestock, then you're probably focusing in, in crops, which is corn and soybeans in this area. Um, it's pretty rare to have a real diverse operation. They, they do exist, and, and, but it's, it's very rare to have that real diverse operation like I grew up with. Uh, uh, I would expect another difference is the nature of the crop rotation that you've got here versus what you experienced growing up. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, the crop rotation is still fairly similar. Um, I grew up, you know, Litchfield's 100 miles south of here, and the climate's just a little bit different. We grew a lot more wheat in the rotation. Um, so we were doing corn, soybeans, and wheat, and of course with livestock we had some hay in the rotation as well. And sometimes the wheat was there more for the, the straw and, and the cover crop for the hay. So again, back to the livestock. But moving back up here, you know, it was pretty much strictly a the wheat. We've tried wheat in the area; it just doesn't do very well. It's a little bit more tough crop to manage in this area. And the corn and soybeans, just full season corn and full season soybeans, just do so much better than some of the double cropping we could do down south. But um, so really around here, it's, it's all about corn and soybeans. But in the, in the old days, you would want to rotate the crops so you can get the nitrogen back into the soil. And is that not necessary anymore? Well, right. Um, and we still do rely heavily on rotation, but probably less for the fertility and more for some of the disease aspects, um, particularly in soybeans. Um, we would never, we really shy away from uh, continuous soybean production because we have some disease and pest pressures that we can uh, fight with corn. Corn's a little different animal though. We can uh, do continuous corn without too many problems. But yeah, you're right. In the past, you know, we've, we'd grow a lot of crops and then that hay crop, the last hay crop might get plowed under to make green manure. And because we didn't have the, the knowledge we do about agronomics today or the chemicals and the fertilizers and things back then. But over the years, we've developed. Um, We've learned that we can use commercial fertilizers and chemicals and things to, to take the place of a lot of things we were doing for fallow operations before. And still, uh, and we found other production practices, and we're, we're pretty much 100% no-till, for example, and we're actually building our soil tilth and, and actually improving our soil versus what it was a year ago by using different tillage methods and, and focusing on uh, a better production, crop production methods. And can do as good or better job than we ever have before because of advances in technology. Okay. I want to come back to this issue about renting versus ownership. I mean, yeah. most Americans think of the, the family farm, the classic American family farm, is that you're owning the land. And I'm sure most Americans driving by this operation here would jump to the conclusion that you're a farmer that owns the land. So tell me yeah. about that relationship of renting versus owning and what the implications for us. Right. Well, that's true. Um, you know, historically, you go back to the 1860s when, I think the 1860s when the Homestead Act started. You know, you come in, you settle, and you get 160 acres, and the government gave it to you, and, and you grew it from there. And, uh, and then all you had to worry about was getting the equipment. You own the land. But then at some point, the land became more valuable, and the equipment became more valuable. It went through the the tractor was invented and we found out we could farm a lot more land uh, with one person than we ever could before and, and one thing led to another and, and ultimately we got today where the equipment lets us farm far more than we ever could before but the land is also worth a lot more. So what we have is equipment that takes a lot of capital to own it. We have land that takes a lot of capital to own it and we have an individual that d doesn't have the resources to meet both of them. And so you have to make a decision. You're either going to be a landowner and hire somebody to farm it for you, or you're going to be the farmer that 
that owns the equipment and finds somebody to own the land and then, then share it. Or you have to uh, settle for somewhere in between and then try to use sacrifice on one or the other. So we've, uh, you know, and people have found ways to put this all together and, and be very successful at it on, in, on any terms. But I think what's happened, the predominant path has been that we see um, outside investors, people from Wall Street, for example, that want to own land and have a lot of money they've made somewhere else and want land as a safe investment, for example. And they'll invest in the land and tie up their capital there for a small return, but hoping for appreciation of land values and things like that. So they're very happy owning the land. And then we have farmers over here that have the skill and technology available that can do a great job farming that land for them. And, but they have their own capital tied up in all this equipment. And so they, they focus their efforts and knowledge and skill base on owning that equipment and doing the best job they can and managing land and then finding these other people to own the land and then they, they share. Um, they'll either pay a cash stipend to, to, own, uh, to farm the land for the farmer or like we have some of those and we also have some where we just physically share everything 50-50 and the landlord pays half the expenses and we pay half and we get half the crop and they get half and, and in turn we supply the labor and equipment and they supply the land. And um, so, and that works out very well. It's it's a win-win for everyone, and we're able to take advantage of this the better equipment, get it over more land, acres, and uh, it's, it's it's just a it's like a, a big partnership, and it works very well. Um, and it's it's been great through the years, and it's for the most part working. But um, you you can see some signs where where you get into trouble with that, and and that is where. Where if it works fine in a 50-50, but then you start getting competition, and the farmer, you know, starts losing a little bit here, or the landlord loses a bit here. So then you know the, the greed sometimes enters into it. The landlord wants more. The farmer needs more. The land, you know, things happen, and, and it's a little bit out of your control at times. So, can you talk a little bit more about the dynamics of uh, basically cash rent versus sharecropping rent? Right. In part, you know, I hear the term sharecropping, and I jump to this, you know, this yeah. image that Americans have about sharecroppers. It's somebody down in the south, oh. and he's barely <laughs> scraping a, a, right. a living right. through. Yeah. Well, ultimately, you know, it doesn't matter. There's different types of, of partnerships out here. You can call them crop shares, which basically mean we're, we're kind of in this together. We share the risk equally. You know, if uh, the landowner's going to pay for half the expenses, like I said, and I'm going to pay for half. And I'm going to get half the crop, and he's going to get half the crop. So if it's a good crop, we both we both uh, um, are, are rewarded. If it's a bad crop, we both share on the risk, and um, you know, and we're we, we're kind of in it together. Um, the other arrangement is is uh, more of a cash rent, whereas I I just pay I I try to budget out what I think I can make on this land, and I say, well, I can I can give you this much guaranteed. I'll give you two hundred dollars an acre guaranteed. And I, I give that to you up front, and then everything's on me. So um, I give the landlord his $200. He has no risk in it anymore, and, and that's what his return is. And then it's all up to me to, to make enough to cover that $200 and hopefully more. And uh, so, But a lot more risk on me at that point. Which do you prefer? Well, again, uh, we have a little bit of both. And, um, and it gets back to why we have corn and soybeans, too. We're, we're kind of diverse. We try to spread our risk and uh, not put it all in one basket that way. But um, the crop share is, is probably the most fairest way because you're both sharing the risk and you're both supplying, um, you know, you're both supplying something valuable to the equation and you're both getting rewards from it. The crop, sh the cash rent, is uh, a little more risky, like I said, but usually with risk comes greater rewards. So if you can negotiate a fair cash rent, you have an opportunity to, in a good year, to really reap a lot of rewards, but if you face a drought or a bad year or um, prices turn against you, then you have the opportunity to lose more than, than you would too. So, In these equations, how, does, how is the decision of when to sell your grain factor into it? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, ultim uh, I guess... Is it your decision or is it the owner's decision, first of all? Well, well, in a crop share agreement, you know, we're, we both have our own grain. We both sell our own grain. Okay. In a cash rent, it's all me, so it's all my decision. So, but my grain is all my decision, and um, I use a variety of sources to make that decision. We we hire, we pay a fee to a consultant to try to give us ongoing market advice. But 
ultimately it comes back to me doing a lot of budgeting, knowing what my cost of production are, and knowing what price I have to have. Um, so that becomes my floor. I know I have to have this to cover all my costs and expenses and such. And then, and then secondly, it comes back to my advisor who's telling me, you know, this is where prices could go. So we start, we start making incremental sales. We'll sell a percentage uh, as it goes up and, and trying to make all the time making sure we cover our costs, but then hoping to get a little bit more on top of that. Now, later today, we're going to go watch you harvest some soybeans. Um, let's put a, a face, if you will, to that marketing decision. What's going to happen with that grain? Yeah. Let's assume that you have control over that. Right, right. The grain that I'm going to sell there, <clears throat> a lot of it's been priced already. And this gets back, you know, we're pricing this grain before we ever even know we're going to grow it. When um, you say price, you've already sold it? Sold. It's sold. It's, it's under contract. Um, so uh, you were able to sell some of this grain when the market was high? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Probably not enough at this point. But, but, but you know, farmers are eternal optimists. And we know it's all going back to $20 again somewhere. So, But, <laughs> but, no, but no, we are. I mean, there's logical reasons to think it, it will come back to some extent, probably not as high as it was. But, uh, but we know uh, we're not going to make sales today because we know we're we're probably at the low of the market, so we're not making any sales today. We're, What's the market today? Oh, it's, today we're maybe nine dollars a bushel. I, I haven't checked, but you know we're down at you know we were at one time seventeen dollars a bushel. So you know, but it, I think it's indicative you're glancing over your computer, which is oh. just the screensaver now. But that's part of the business. Isn't oh yeah, that's you know I spend an hour in, in this office every morning on the internet. Looking at the, what the markets did overnight, looking at what they're going to possibly do for the day, looking at some advice, reading commentaries, and, and I'll probably spend another hour at night when I come in before I go in the house doing the same thing. And, and then I also carry a PDA with me all day long, uh, making sure I'm up to date on you know anything happens to shock the system or something. But uh, so you're following the weather and you're following the market. Yeah. Well, we're probably following the weather more than the market when we're harvesting because you know our focus is probably a little bit too much on on the production aspect of it that time. But but yeah, we're we're trying to keep our eyes on everything all all day long. Do you have the ability to store grain then, so you can yes. play the market a little yeah. bit better? Yeah. So you know, we we start the year. Um, in fact, we're looking at probably we're already looking at next year's crop, not just this year's crop. But I mean, for, right now we're looking at next year's crop and maybe even the O10 crop. And um, so if we see a pricing opportunity, it gets a little scary in the environment we're at because we know the import prices have been going up and up and up, and we don't know if the prices today will cover that. We do know that ultimately when we get ready to plant this crop, we should have an opportunity to cover our costs after we get them locked in. So we're a little reluctant, but if we see a good price, we'll maybe start making a percentage of our sales just to get, a, get something started. But for the crop we're harvesting today, though, we started that um, after we had most... Uh, well, we started a long time ago, but we really got more aggressive after we had most of our crops in, lined up. We knew what they were; they were locked in, and then we and we had then we have a good idea of what we think we can produce in a normal year, and so we'll start selling a percentage of that crop. We won't sell it all. We won't even sell all of what we think we can grow. We'll, we'll just start selling a percentage of that, and um, so we'll get that locked in as that far, and um, we might do that through just flat out signing a contract that says we'll sell for this price, or we might. Go actually go to the board of trade and sell a contract on the board of trade, put a traditional hedge on, or buy an option or something like that. And then after the crops harvested, then we know exactly what we have, and we'll um, then we'll start looking for opportunities to price the rest of the crop. And again, like I said, we're not going to sell that today because we look at cycles and trends and information, and our advisors are telling us, you know, this is probably the bottom of the market. If anything, it might go down from here, but it's certainly going to go up at some point. It might. Might only go up a dollar, or might only go up fifty cents, but it's going to go up something. But um, is it possible that you can uh, sell more of your future crop than you end up harvesting? Yeah, and that's that's the risk we get into. It's, it's why I say we don't, we're not going to sell everything we think. You know, if you know, if our we keep historical records, we know what and and we know what we've done in the past, and and we we know what our worst yields have been, we know what our best yields have been. And we're certainly not going to sell our best yield. Well, well, we may consider selling our worst yield, but most likely we're probably only going to sell 50% of our worst yield until we actually, um, you know, we start walking this crop in the summer. We see it's getting better. We'll start making more sales. Um, and when we get closer to harvest, we see an opportunity to sell, you know, and we, 
the more certain we have of what we can sell, we'll be more inclined to sell that crop. But um, we're also at the same time want to make sure we get a good price for it. So we'll, and then we'll um, store this crop in one form or another if we have to. Uh, we have a lot of on-farm storage to take care of most of it. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll ultimately store it through the summer and find an opportunity to sell it at some point before next year's harvest comes in. We're getting close to the point where we want to head to the field and actually allow you to actually yeah. make a living. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> but I wanted to talk a little bit about the Illinois Soybean Association, and I think that will allow you to talk about the book you got sitting oh, there. Oh, yeah. There too. yeah. <laughs> well, yes, and you know, that's, that's another challenging opportunity. Um, you know, I, I talked about, you know, the, the life I grew up, the, the community I grew up in and the class I went to and the world we were in back then was definitely more rural oriented. And farmers, you know, when I was, I guess if I would have grown up being my age back then, I would have been a middle-aged farmer. You know, no doubt, everybody would have looked at me as a middle-aged farmer. Today, I'm, I'm called a young farmer. I, and in fact, I am one of the youngest farmers in my area. There's, there's a few younger than me, but not too many. Uh, there's certainly a lot more older than me, and I'm in my early 40s right now, and um, I'm considered a very young farmer, and that's kind of what's happened out here. There's just fewer of us out here, and there's fewer of us out here to represent agriculture, and the Illinois Soybean Association is one of the important commodity organizations out there. We have an organization for corn, an organization for soybeans, and one for wheat, and the livestock industries, and of course we have the Farm Bureau over all that, but, but all those are voices for our policies and our direction or for our future. And there's less and less farmers out there to, to, to fill those roles. And, and we've kind of identified that as important that we do our share to, to, to be part of that and to have our voice heard and, and to make sure farmers are getting good representation. So that, you know, that was one decision we made. We sacrificed a little time to sit on this board. I, I ran and I got elected to this as a, as a director on the Illinois Soybean Board and uh, Illinois Soybean Association Board. And I served there and I've been on there for about three years now. And um, again, I've also, also, among that board, I was elected to the executive committee as well, so I serve in that capacity and help guide the organization from that level. Um, but it's just, it gets back to, you've got to have some kind of community sense about yourself. We try to participate in the community as well, but this is just one example specific to agriculture. And it's important because we, we have to promote our product, and soybeans is a good example. We have a checkoff where every farmer, by law, has to give a portion of his sales to this checkoff fund, and, and in the past that's amounted to about $12 million that goes into fund every year that's dedicated for production research and developing new products that are going to ultimately prom to promote soybeans so that they be, remain profitable for farming. And uh, well, that money sets in this fund and has to be administered by somebody, and, and one of the jobs of the Illinois Soybean Board is to oversee that money and make sure it's invested wisely. And so when I sit on that board, that's what I do, and uh, yeah, you mentioned my book. How to do hold business in China. Yeah, hold that up so <laughs> yeah. we can read the title here. Yeah, doing business in China. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, um, you know, we are in a global marketplace. Uh, good or bad, you know, that's farming deals. Uh, we produce far more than we can ever use in this country. Even with the advent of biofuels, we still export so much, and we have to deal with the rest of the world. What percentage yeah. of the soybean crop uh, in the United States do we typically export? And typically, you know, 40% of our soybeans is exported and, uh, as whole soybeans. And, and where is that? Typically? And most of that, and our, one of our biggest buyers is China. And, um, and we continue, we're helping, we, we continue to help try to develop those types of markets. We, we sell a lot to China and Japan and, and the Philippines, and, in, and we're even doing, uh, we don't sell a lot directly to India, but, you know, there are big consumers over there, and we tr try to make sure they use a lot of soybeans, takes soybeans off the market. So we're doing all those kinds of things. Um, but, um, but, but that's, you know, getting back to the board, that's, that's what our job is, to try to make sure these monies are getting used effectively. And, of course, one of, one of the things we're trying to do in China is develop, help them develop the aquaculture market. You know, China, when we talk about aquaculture, that's the actual farming of fish. I'm not talking about wild catch, but, you know, China, aquaculture in China is 70% of the world's production. That's where all the fish are being grown, and it's not in the best, under the best terms. It's, uh, um, they've got a lot, a lot of improvements they can make. They're not fully using all the technology and, and things that, they're, that, that they can use, and but one of the things we've identified is we can incorporate a lot of soybeans in their diets of so these fish and, and help them be better producers of fish, and it, it's a great market for soybeans. So we've invested a lot of money in aquaculture. So one of my jobs was to go over there and, and to 
to view that research and, and to see how it's going and, and to see if there's anything else we can do for them and, and make sure our money's getting invested wisely over there. It, uh, well, you meant we've talked before we started the film here that uh, you actually had the opportunity here just recently to, to go to China. Can you tell us a little bit more about that trip? Yeah. Who you went with and exactly what it is that you were doing? Yeah. That, that's back to this aquaculture, and that was the, the whole purpose. Um, we um, <clears throat> went with a group, actually, it was the United Soybean Export Council put the program together, and they invite um, uh, directors from the different state organizations. I serve on the Illinois State Board, and so two of us from the Illinois Board went, and two of us from Nebraska, and two of us from Kentucky, and that was our contingency. And uh, we went over there to represent all of the, the national, nationwide soybean producers for United States and to, uh, to observe what they're doing to, and to get to see how the results were going and get feedback from them how we can do a better job and and to make sure that you know our message is getting out properly and that our money is getting spent wisely over there um, so we spent spent a week in the Philippines looking at what they're doing there and we spent another week in China uh, seeing how they're doing things there and uh, so we got to learn a lot about the world and how we do in business we got to build some relationships and uh, and very important, but uh, it, it's just, as I come back here, it's, it's, I get to talk a lot with other farmers, and it's, um, when you go over there, you talk to a lot of farmers, and when you, when you talk to farmers over there, they've seen the rest of the world. They've been everywhere else, and you can talk to them about different experiences. You come here, you you're telling other farmers about the rest of the world. They haven't seen the rest of the world, and that's, that to me is what we, we uh, is one of the things we kind of lack in the ag world. We, we don't see the whole world yet. Uh, we don't appreciate what goes on in different cultures and how to do business. And you know, that book talking about how to do business in China, it's a different culture. It's a whole different way of doing business in China than it is anywhere else in the world, really. And, uh, different, better, different, worse? Just, uh, different. just, just different. Just different. And there, see, that's, that's a good example. There's no such thing as different, better, or different, worse because uh, that's our mentality. I think actually, if you ask most farmers, they would say it's different, worse because they, they do things, you know, here we have to pay, here's one example, okay, we, if I want to do something, I have to, to file for a permit and pay a fee to the EPA or whatever, do things like that, you know, the classic example, and not to get too specific. You go over there, they kind of do that all, same thing, but it's all kind of under the table. <laughs> but it's the same thing, you know, it really is, but, but that's what they grew up with, that's, what they, that's how they know how to do business, and they're comfortable with it over there. And people, and when they're doing business over there, they know that. But um, that's just one example, and and I don't mean that's what I'm saying. You know, we view it as different, worse. They view it as just different, and uh, but but really, it goes deeper than that. I mean that, and that's such a minor thing. It's really just about when you go over there to do business with China. You know, they're more interested in the relationship and and knowing who they're building that trust. And, and it comes back to that doing business under the table because if they trust you. They know they can trust you under the table or otherwise. If they don't trust you, that they just don't do business with you. Whereas here, we look at more of the bottom line. We say, well, the numbers make sense. We don't care if we trust you or not. And you can get burnt in the rest of the world with that attitude, and you can get burnt the way China's doing it in the rest of the world. Actually, it's, it's important to understand both sides. Did, did you see the Chinese and the Filipinos? I guess as being eager to establish closer business relationships. Oh, oh yes, yeah. I mean. That was very obvious. I mean, the rest, everybody wants to do better in this world. And everybody sees the only way you get better is to be, it has to be a win-win. And they want to expand. They want to find ways that they can use more of our soybeans. Because we've shown, that's one of the biggest um, accomplishments we have in the aquaculture world. We've put a lot of demonstration plots in to show them that they, if they adapt these things, they'll make more money. And then they see other, and we've, we've identified like a handful of producers to do that. And other producers see that. And it's grown from there. So American money being invested in China to establish demonstration plots? Right. We, we show them how they can use uh, floating fish feeds made from soybeans, for example, and how it saves them labor, how it saves they grow faster, they're higher quality, and they, get, they ultimately make more money. And we've showed that to them. But before they were just, until they see it, until they actually see it, they're, they're so tied to their traditional ways of doing things, which was just throw some manure out in the into a pond, let the algae grow up, and, and let the fish feed themselves, and to take two or three years to do what they can do with one year with, with a much cleaner, more sanitary environment. Um, until they actually see that, um, they, they won't accept it. 
And uh, so that, that's been very valuable. So they learn this. And, then, and, they're, and once they can see it, they can see, oh, there's tremendous value here. And, then what, and, and you know, there's nothing bad about the dollar. It, it shows you where you should be investing your, your resources. And it's the same over there. When they make money, they're happy. And, and they know that's the area they need to pursue. And, well, you see that big time in China and the Philippines is they all want to get better and they all want to have a better lifestyle and they strive for success. Now, before we get out in the field, one more question for you to yeah. kind of wrap things up. What do you see as the future of agriculture here in Illinois? Where do you see the trend lines headed? Well, the biggest trend, I think the most obvious trend is going to be bigger. <laughs> we see that, and that's, that's what becomes very evident, is that the farms have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger every generation. My grandfather um, was a big farmer. I mean, he was considered a big farmer with 300 acres. Okay? And pr that, was, that was a big farm back then. You know, 160 acres was the standard. If you had double that, you were a big farmer. Um, my father-in-law started this operation with 1,200 acres, and he was a big farmer. Um, we started in this, Connie and I took this over, and we were running this 2,000 acres, 2,200 acres, and we were a big farmer five years ago, 10 years ago. Today, we're just average again, and uh, the big farmers are farming 10, 20, 40,000 acres. And I think that's the trend we're going to continue to see, and that's what's going to be the real obvious thing from the outside. People looking in are going to see that. What you're not going to see is on the inside is, is what, how it's going to change is that farming is going to continue to become more of a business and that's important. It always has been a business and it is a business. But I think you're going to, you're going to see a divide. Uh, you're going to see some of the, the hobby farms continue, the lifestyle farms continue and those are going to be in existence. But the other end of it is going to be more, the bigger, more efficient operations are going to prevail. And it's going to be, again, they're going to focus on the equipment. They're going to have the investors for the land and, and build this big base to work on. Um, what, you're, what comes with that, though, is back to what the downside of farmers not owning the land is this serfdom mentality, the feudal system of the, the medieval times where the king owned all the land and then you became a serf. and You, you, you don't have the leverage. Being the, the tenant owner, you don't have quite the leverage you do is owning the land. The, you know, the land is pretty finite. There's only so much land and ultimately they're the ones that kind of, that's like the gold. And the, the, those who have the gold kind of make the rules. Uh, the equipment, you can always make more equipment. Management, that's pretty finite. That's the only thing you have left to hold on to as a tenant farmer. And that's what's going to be their savior, but that's still replaceable as well. And it sounds like in your heart of hearts you'd like to be that owner. Well, there's... But there again, there's good and bad with all of it, and it's always a trade-off. But that's what we have to be careful of. Um, we're we're trying. We got a delicate balance going on here, and ultimately, the system, the marketplace we live in right now today doesn't allow that. Yeah, ultimately, I wish I did own all the land, but the land values are overinflated to the point that you can't justify it. Um, if they would come back to more like they were back when we had back in the 60s before the first revolution, then, then it made sense, but they've gotten to the point where you, you've almost got to pick your path. What's an acre of land around here cost then? Oh, name your price today. I mean, at the peak of the 80s, right before the collapse, you know, we were at $4,000 was the peak, and then it fell back to about $2,000 an acre, and it floated in that two to three for a long time. And then just, uh, just here recently, um, we had a piece of land, uh, Probably a little bit more out of the ordinary is like ten thousand dollars an acre. The going rate I'd say today is more like seventy five hundred dollars an acre. So you know we're we're talking about land that's double what we were at the peak of the, the uh, of anything in the past. So and and that's the kind of money we're talking about. Is it's hard to to have that kind of capital tied up. And when you're trying to own a piece of an asset that you're trying to derive income from, that's your sole reason for owning that in, that asset it's hard to have that much money tied up in it. If you're trying to own an asset because you think you're, it's an investment, it's going to appreciate, you're, going to, you're speculating on it, well, that's, that's, what, that's where it's at today. The people that own the land today are kind of more speculative and more invested, and that's why they own the land. Uh, the equipment is more what I can own and, and, and make money from now. Do you see these trends as a positive thing? Well, I, it's, it's a bit disturbing, uh, I would say, but um, um, no, I, I wouldn't call it positive. 
but it's, it's a reality of the, with the government policies we have in place today and, and where things have been pushed from. I mean, it's, it's what's happening. Uh, I would certainly like to think, see things uh, go a different route, but because um, but, ultimately the, the best care of the land is going to happen when you have your individual farmers that can, and you know, that individual farmer could easily, with new technology, be this 40,000 acre guy, but today that's not the case. But someday it may be the case, and that's fine. But um, ultimately, when you have one person that can take care of this land and, and, and focus on it, you're, you get a lot better results, I think, than when you turn it into something that's just, just a routine and, and just a job for them. <laughs> okay. Well, the next time we see you on film, we'll get to see the exciting stuff of actually harvesting the soybeans. But it's been great talking to you. It's been very enlightening for me, and I'm sure it will be for anybody who has the time to, to take a look at this. So thank you very much, Matt. Well, thank you.